can see the participants starting to come on. And I want to thank everyone for being on. We're going to wait a few minutes uh, to get everybody collected. me this is always the most awkward time of a of a, <laughs> of a presentation or lecture or webinar having also grown up in new york i have a, a huge problem with silence we need some music Would that help we do we do <laughs> Okay, in one minute, we're going to start with the introduction. We're also well behaved. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining. And I'm sure as we begin this um, seminar, there, there will be uh, additional folks joining uh, as participants. I want to welcome everyone to uh, the Leaning In Seminar from the Multi-Regional Clinical Trial Center of the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard. We're talking about practical approaches to improving diversity, inclusion, and equity in clinical trials. Um, so I want to say that this, uh, next slide, please, um, that that we are uh, responsible for our own content and what the views and, and findings expressed in this webinar and in the document to which I will refer do not imply endorsement or reflect the views of the US uh, Food and Drug Ad Administration or the affiliated organizations or entities of the members who, who contributed um, each individual served in their individual capacity and the MRCT Center itself is supported by voluntary contributions, unrestricted contributions and by grants. Could I have the next slide? So um, today is, is the last in a series of um, planned uh, webinars which were really designed to unpack the work that a group of us have done over the last two and a half years on diversity, inclusion, and equity in clinical trials. Today, we're going to be talking about the role of data in diversity, both genetics and real world data, and we'll introduce that further. Each of the record, each of the, the webinars that have um, uh, preceded this, one today, as well as the slides are available on the website, which you can see at the bottom of this slide. And the, the, the meeting today will be recorded and is being recorded and the slides and the meeting itself will also be available probably on Friday or Monday of this week. Could I have the next uh, slide? So today I'm, I'm privileged to introduce uh, the co-panelists uh, today on genetics and real world data. Um, first, we will hear from Luther Clark, who is the Deputy Chief Patient Officer at Merck. We will then uh, hear from Latha Palaniapan, uh, who is a professor of medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. And finally, from Nicole Ritchie, who is the uh, Global Head of Health Equity and Population Science 
at Genentech Roche. Um, uh, because we have so much to communicate today, I'm going to keep the introductions very short. Um, next slide. So the Multi-Regional Clinical Trial Center, for those of you who do not know, it are, uh, is a research and policy center based at Harvard and the Brigham that is dedicated to improving the safety, integrity, and rigor of global clinical trials. And we do that work by engaging diverse stakeholders from pharma, CROs, academia, um, uh, patient, patient advocates, uh, uh, nonprofit, and regular nonprofit organizations and regulatory organizations uh, and authorities um, to define emerging issues in global clinical trials, and then really not to just define those issues, but to create and implement ethical, actionable, and practical solutions. We, um, could I have the next slide? We started working on uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity in clinical research approximately uh, three years ago uh, after we saw the publication of the snapshot data from the FDA. Um, and that uh, compelled us to begin to address the problem that really um, uh, there is uh, uh, underrepresentation in research of uh, a number of different subgroups uh, that, that really should be part of the research enterprise and that in their absence of participation, we really, uh, science suffers, but also social uh, uh, equity concerns arise. That work is published in, um, in a document as well as a toolkit that's available on our website. And I should say that it has also been now uh, released on amazon.com uh, for uh, purchase at cost. We don't get any royalties so that people don't have to print the document. It is uh, approximately 400 pages of great reading. Uh, could I have the next slide? So um, the, the work itself was led by two members from the FDA, Sharday uh, uh, Araujo and Milena Lolich. Um, uh, Luther Clark, who you'll hear from later today, uh, by S David Strauss from Columbia University, myself and Sarah White at the MRCT Center, and then uh, really dedicated staff uh, from the MRCT Center itself. But I have to say that none of this would have been possible without the real um, committed participation of over 50 uh, work group members who stayed with us uh, and really worked through what were at times very difficult uh, uh, conversations and difficult issues to address. Um, and I hope that the product itself is helpful. Could I have the next slide, please? So um, we really, in the guidance document, uh, tried to go through each of the issues first define it and make a case for uh, diversity and then to think through throughout the clinical trial process and more generally the drug development process, how to uh, think through practical and actionable recommendations to change uh, and bend the curve towards greater representation. Um, we also talk through uh, accountability so that each stakeholder can change their paradigm of how they do the work and the results that they see. And the toolkit itself uh, provides adaptable resources which are not easily found elsewhere. We didn't want to repeat what people had already put forward, but rather tried to develop resources that we thought would be helpful for uh, individuals that we could not find. Could I have the next slide? So um, I don't want you to think that this will be the last of the series. We are uh, going to continue this series starting again in April. We're taking a month off uh, for reasons that I'll describe uh, shortly. And we are going to uh, um, continue this series at least monthly by uh, it, um, discussing areas that were covered less well in the document itself and to highlight work 
that individuals are doing uh, in order to change um, representation uh, going forward. So stay tuned, you'll, you'll hear from us. We're excited about this uh, continuing series. It's been very popular to date and we intend to continue. Um, could I have the next slide? So in, in March, we will release an updated uh, diversity, inclusion and equity in clinical trials microsite, um, which is going to unpack the document. Right now, it's only available as a complete dot download, but really create tools and resources for individuals uh, and organizations um, in, a, in a way that is digestible and easier to find and follow. So uh, we will announce that. Please subscribe to our newsletter and you'll hear all about that. Could I have the next slide? And if you have not subscribed to our newsletter or follow us, please do so um, at mrctcenter.org. We're also in LinkedIn and on Twitter. I should, uh, we is very uh, hopeful. I do none of that. I attribute all of that to the great work of Jen Ewing and others at the center. Um, as I am a non-tweeting individual. Could I have the next slide? So uh, uh, let me pause here with that brief introduction and invite Luther to talk through what, um, uh, uh, sort of to take us through what the guidance document said and then to proceed to some additional com comments. Luther? Great, uh, thank you, Barbara. And uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to today's uh, program. It's really a, a great pleasure for me to be a part of today's uh, webinar and to be a participant on such a uh, distinguished uh, panel. I'll set the stage for uh, today's discussion by speaking to you bre very briefly about the implications of recent advances in genetics and genomics for clinical research uh, diversity. Next slide, please. Let, let's begin with a few definitions for those of us who are not experts in genetics, genomics, and, uh, and uh, ancestry. Uh, genetics can be thought of as the study of heredity, uh, specifically the function and composition of single or individual genes, whereas genomics usually refers to the study of genes more broadly, their functions, their interrelationships, and related techniques and uh, technologies. Geographic uh, ancestry refers to uh, locations of family and population origins, and uh, genetic ancestry uh, refers to a method of quantifying ancestral black background statistically by understanding genome history. And keep in mind that uh, different regions and different genomic segments may have their own and very different uh, ancestral uh, histories. And of course, race is a sociocultural construct. These are not biologically distinct groups, but rather genetically admixed uh, populations. Next slide. So there's tremendous uh, potential for genetics and genomics, both for advancing research and for transforming uh, healthcare, including the potential of individual tailoring uh, for prevention and treatment strategies, as well as the potential for a much wider adoption due to recent advances in research technologies and the decreasing cost of DNA sequencing. Now in the MRCT guidance document, we employed a broad definition of diversity. However, if you consider only uh, race and ethnicity, there was a recent uh, publication uh, based on data from the FDA, which showed that approximately 20% of newly FDA approved molecular entities indicated differences in exposure and response across racial and ethnic groups. And these resulted in different prescribing recommendations for specific uh, populations. The uh, mechanisms and explanations were not provided, but these can certainly uh, benefit from additional uh, study. Next slide. Now, as I already mentioned, self-identified race and ethnicity are crude social constructs, and these are genetically admixed uh, populations. And the degree of admixture can vary quite widely. 
both within groups and between groups. The figure to the right, uh, which I took from an article that just appeared in last week's uh, New England Journal of Medicine, is based on an analysis of the Latino asthmatic uh, GWAS. And what it shows is that if you look at the ancestral origins of the participants, and specifically the degree of African, European, and Native American uh, ancestry, these vary quite widely. And even, and certainly between the two groups, but if you look at the top panel for Mexican Americans, you can see that individuals vary quite substantially in their uh, admixture percentages uh, as well. Now, geographic ancestry may correlate with race and ethnicity, but tends to reflect different uh, attributes and does not predict in an individual their genotype or response to uh, drugs. Now, interestingly, in the article for which the panel is taken on the right, the authors concluded that uh, geographic ancestry was a better predictor of the presence of, of uh, genetic variants, whereas self-identified race and ethnicity you know, was a, greater, a better proxy for such factors as, uh, as social determinants and uh, environments. But it's clear that additional genomic and precision medicine study can advance our understanding of race, of ethnicity, and certainly their utility in clinical practice and research. Uh, next slide, please. Now it's well known to uh, all of us that uh, there are differences in responses to therapies based on race, ethnicity, and geographic uh, ancestry. And a few examples of these are listed on the next two uh, slides. For example, the decreased responsiveness of the antiplatelet therapy clopidogrel in Asians turns out to be due to a genetic variation in the expression of an enzyme that is important for the bioactivation of clopidogrel from the inactive to the active uh, form. The increased risk of uh, a particularly severe skin disorder called Steven Johnson syndrome in uh, patients who are treated with carbamazepine, which is used for seizures, is uh, increased uh, in uh, Han Chinese uh, in particular. And this is due to a particular uh, HLA allele that is more commonly present. So much so that the FDA uh, actually recommends genotyping agents for the allele, allele if they need to be put on carbamazepine uh, therapy. NASH, a form of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is more common in Hispanics and there's a genetic marker that is uh, helpful in predicting this, although much more needs to be uh, known. And cystic fibrosis, of course, is well known to be a genetic disorder most common among Northern European uh, ancestry. Next slide. So in terms of uh, you know, African-Americans, Blacks in the US and African ancestry, it is well known and has been known for a long time that there are differences in uh, disease prevalence and severity and responses to certain uh, treatments. For example, the uh, medication Bidil, which is a combination medicine of nitrates and hydralazine, showed a very strong benefit in self-identified Blacks with heart failure, not seen in others, uh, but the explanation remains unknown. It has been long known that uh, hypertension is more common and more severe, and that there are certain medications for which there is less responsiveness in uh, Blacks. Uh, for example, uh, ACE uh, inhibitors, in which there is decreased responsiveness but also a greater risk for certain side effects such as angioedema. Now in the uh, MRC uh, document, we highlighted uh, the PCSK9 and PCSK9 inhibitors uh, as uh, an example. And this is an interesting one. So PCSK9 uh, inhibitors are a type of recent treatment for elevated uh, cholesterol levels. 
And it turns out that in early development and work that was done at the Dallas Heart Study, which is a biracial cohort, uh, self-identified Blacks were more likely to have the common PCSKS9 gene variant that was associated with loss of function, lower LDL cholesterol levels, and decreased cardiovascular risk uh, compared to whites. And it was the identification of these genetic variants and their enrichment, which was present uh, in uh, the Blacks in the study that were important to both the discovery and understanding of PCSK9, but also the development of an important treatment for treating uh, elevated uh, cholesterol. So as I heard in a meeting that I was at last yesterday, if there is not diversity in your research, one can often leave science on the table and innovations, potential innovations can be lost or more difficult. Then of course, sickle cell disease, uh, which results from a, a mutation is often thought of as a disease only in those of African descent, although it's certainly found in other uh, ethnicities. Next slide, please. A another example, which I'd just like to uh, highlight uh, to demonstrate the importance of geographic diversity, uh, certainly in medicines uh, discovery and development, is that of hepatitis C and the interaction between viral genomics and host genomics. It turns out that there are six major genotypes of the hepatitis C virus that infect the liver. And these vary in prevalence, both regional and across ethnic and racial groups, a disease severity and responses to treatment. Now hepatitis C is potentially curable but treatment efficacy must be tested and demonstrated for each of the major viral genotypes. Thus, it has to be tested in those populations in those regions where those genotypes are present. Next slide. So in terms of genomics and health equity, it's clear that Genomics has the potential to improve health outcomes broadly, but the benefits may not be available to all populations. And the reason for that, certainly one of the major reasons is that racial and ethnic minorities are underrepresented in genomic databases. This lack of diversity in genomic research limits our understanding of the relationships of the, of the genes and of diseases in the unstudied and certainly understudied uh, populations. The uh, figure to the right uh, is just one example of uh, an analysis of several large uh, GWAS databases, which shows the relatively low participation of non-Europeans. So one of our calls to action today is that as with other types of research, Genomic databases need much greater uh, diversity, uh, inclusion of ancestral populations and collection of ancestral uh, information. Next slide, please. So let me um, finish up these uh, brief re remarks with a comment about direct to consumer genetic uh, testing. These have become increasingly available increasingly popular, and in fact, uh, have given rise to a, a very popular PBS uh, television show led by uh, Henry Louis Gates, who's a professor at Harvard and focused on identifying the roots of famous uh, celebrities. Now, in addition to uh, increasing awareness and interest, there is a real potential for this information, which uh, has now been collected on tens of millions of uh, individuals to support and expand our understanding of the relationships between genetics, geography, ethnicity, and interactions between biological and social determinants. Granted, at present, they're mostly uh, requested to uh, look for uh, family members and 
ancestry, but there's much more potential into how they may be uh, used. It's also important to keep in mind uh, that individuals often have multiple geographic ancestries. And of course, that is not a uh, surprise to us. But the genetic ancestries may be quite different from what the individual themselves believe to be the case and how they self-identify. And I think that is one of the reasons for the great popularity of Dr. Gates' Finding Your Roots uh, series because of the surprises that often uh, appear when uh, genetic ancestry is uh, studied. Next slide. So uh, in conclusion, and uh, setting the stage for our next uh, two uh, speakers, uh, I'd like to share just a few takeaways. The prevalence of genetic variants that impact disease can vary across populations. Uh, increased diversity and inclusion of research participants in genomic and genetic research is necessary if the promise of genetic and genomics are to be uh, realized and to benefit all. There's greater, uh, greater representation of underrepresented individuals and those from geographically diverse populations uh, is important as it will increase our knowledge of genomic variants in population subgroups, geographic ancestry, and then genetic and biological mechanisms linking social de determinants to health and disease. However, uh, at present, our self-identified race certainly continues to have a uh, utility. It's a correlate with geographic ancestry and also an, an important proxy for other difficult to measure factors such as social determinants uh, that may impact our treatment uh, responses. So thank you for your attention. I'll stop there and I'd like to uh, turn the stage over to my colleague, Dr. Latha Palaniapan. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Thank you for uh, your wonderful um, comments. And thank you, Dr. Buer, for inviting me. And thanks to the whole MRCT team for the brilliant organization. I see we have 144 participants on um, the call, and it's uh, been growing over the months, I understand. So thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna be um, using uh, the work that I have done over the last 20 years condensed into 10 minutes for a deep dive into one example of looking at data in diversity using real world data. So I'm going to be talking about examples using national data sets, um, including the National Health Interview Survey, the National Health and uh, Nutrition Examination Survey, electronic health records, as well as mortality data, and also the clinical implications of examining this data, including culturally competent intervention studies, as well as pharmacogenetic differences, as well as community impact that we can make by studying diverse populations. So Asians make up 60% of the world's population. They make up 6% of the US population and 30% of the Bay Area population um, where I live, uh, Stanford on the West Coast. However, NIH funding is only less than 1% to Asian American topics. So we have quite a gap in research in this very diverse population that makes up 60% of the globe. So decisions around Asian health are mainly made using non-Asian data. So these pie charts show global participation in clinical trials. And you can see on the left, that Asians make up only about 12% of the participation in global clinical trials, and they make up 60% of the world's population. So as a doctor in the West Coast taking care of one out of every three of my patients are Asian, I have very little data to go on to guide therapies in this extremely diverse population. I wanna make the point 
you know, when we talk about Asians in the US, that um, they're often considered a model minority, so having high income. This slide is an example of a social determinant of health in Asian subgroups. And you can see all Asians are similar to non-Hispanic whites in terms of 12% having uh, living in poverty. But you can see there's wide diversity across the Asian subgroups. Uh, with Cambodian and Thai having higher rates of poverty compared to other Asian subgroups like Asian Indian, Filipino, and Japanese. And just as a point of reference, um, Cambodian and Thai groups are very similar to Blacks, African Americans in the US in terms of poverty rates. And Hispanic Americans in the US in terms of poverty rates are quite similar to Chinese and Vietnamese. So when we hear about uh, Asians as a whole not being different from non-Hispanic whites, I encourage you to look further and ask you know, what Asian subgroups are we really talking about? And within Asians, there are underrepresented uh, minorities and underserved minorities as well. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about the work that we've done in national data sets, the National Health Interview Survey and NHANES, and, and share a story also that I, I came into this um, because my dad died of a heart attack at 39. And I was 13 years old at the time. And as I went on in my training and went to medical school, I realized that it didn't look like there was any differences between Asians and non-Hispanic whites for heart disease rates. But I realized that I wasn't able to get at information for South Asians or Asian Indians specifically because that disaggregated data wasn't available. Only in recent years has this become available in the last decade or so. So the data that I'm going to share are looking at these national data sets. And I'll point out that the the sample size of Asian Americans in this data set is less than 1500, which um, we'll see that we can use other sources of data to fill in this information. And we can see everywhere that we've looked, every disease area that we've looked, that there's heterogeneity in the Asian American populations, in mental health, in uh, tobacco use, in complementary alternative therapy use, in prediabetes, in diabetes, as well as cardiovascular disease risk factors. Next slide. So I moved to looking at electronic health records in the Bay Area, and you can see that the sample size of Asian Americans was much, much larger, orders of magnitude larger, 250,000 Asian Americans. And this enables us to make much more precise estimates. So as we're considering diversity, and diversity not only defined in terms of race, ethnicity, but also gender, socioeconomic status, disability, sexual identity, we should think about different sources of data that we can use to fill in information. So in our work in electronic health records, which has also been broad, we found differences in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. And this is where the signal for South Asians came out. Next slide. Also, um, how people were treated and adverse outcomes. My father had a PCI and unfortunately had um, an adverse clotting event after that PCI. And, and these are data that we're only able to uncover 40 years after his uh, demise. Next slide. Type two diabetes is also higher in uh, Asian Indian and Filipino groups. Next slide. And then we're trying to do better about predicting cardiovascular disease. In our um, risk prediction scores, we currently have as clinicians only um, Africa, uh, Blacks, African Americans, and whites as race ethnicity, but we're trying to use machine learning to be able to predict atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease better for multi-ethnic populations. Next slide. Um, we're also looking at postpartum depression. Next slide as well as patient satisfaction, which uh, tends to be lower and gives us opportunities for improvement in, in terms of providing culturally competent care to our diverse populations. Next slide. We've also looked at mortality records, so death records in the United States. Next slide. And just in 2003, we started disaggregating Asian subgroups on uh, mortality records and we found geographic variations in cardiovascular disease. Next slide. 
the uh, that leading causes of death are different in different Asian American subgroups with some groups such as uh, Koreans, Chinese and Japanese having more cancer and other groups like Asian Indians and Filipinos having more cardiovascular disease as leading cause of death. Next slide. We are also able to compare um, Chinese and Japanese populations living in the US to uh, death records from country of origin and finding if interesting patterns in immigration. Next slide. And then also looking at uh, differences in risk by body weight. So Asians tend to have lower body weight, but we're finding that they're having increased risk of diabetes despite this low body weight. Next slide. And that as uh, populations lower their risk of cardiovascular disease, which is happening all over the United States, we're transitioning more to cancer as a leading cause of death. Next slide. And um, looking at trends in cancer, there are some cancers that are virally based that are more present in, in Asian populations and having um, specific uh, screening mechanisms, which Dr. Clark also mentioned for hepatitis B and other uh, viral hepatitis. Next slide. Next slide. So with real world data, we are using national data sets, electronic health records, and mortality records, as well as other sources of data to uncover consistent signals on health. So particularly when studying in um, diverse populations where sample sizes might be small in national data sets, it's useful to augment with other sources of data to really provide precision health to the populations that we care for. Next slide. I want to just give some examples of culturally competent intervention studies that we've done for South Asians in particular. Um, next slide. So we've looked at uh, diet interventions and exercise interventions. Next slide. Um, including strength training, particularly for people with normal weight diabetes, because they tend to have relative sarcopenia and 80% of the insulin mediated glucose and uptake in the body is through muscle. So trying to increase muscle as opposed to focusing specifically on excess adiposity in thin diabetics. Next slide. And as Dr. Clark mentioned, there are many pharmacogenetic differences. Um, Dr. Clark mentioned clopidogrel. There's also uh, differences in resuvastatin, cholesterol lowering drug, as well as warfarin, which is a blood thinner, particularly in Asians, in oncological treatments, as well as infectious disease and rheumatology. And we have been able at Stanford to create a organization to address this diversity in, in Asian populations. And it is my dream that we will be able to do this for every diverse population in order to provide um, equitable therapies for all of the populations that we serve. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to our next presenter, um, Dr. Nicole Ritchie, who's the global head of Health Equity and Population Science at Genentech Roche. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Palania Pan um, and Dr. Clark. Uh, it's an honor to be here, Dr. Beer. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, both speakers have provided some perspective um, on these terminology, but given the importance of both the information they convey as well as um, differentiation between them, I'm going to touch, touch on them again briefly. So um, as Dr. Clark mentioned, race and ethnicity are um, social factors that are actually defined um, at the federal level. Another important thing to note um, that has also been mentioned is that they're important social constructs, um, but also their US terminology. So they have different meanings in, in the global context. Um, ancestry is calculated by genetic information and it is exists in five groups. These are superpopulations as defined by the Thousand Genome Project. And then finally, geographic origin, um, which is reflecting the location or region of one's origin. Um, next slide, please. And you can go ahead and click again. So uh, from a clinical uh, and scientific perspective, both ancestry as well as race and ethnicity are certainly important elements that can convey 
um, important but different informa information. At the most basic level, ancestry is a way of categorizing a group of genes. The relevance of this information is when we can differentiate the signal or variant associated with pathology from a variant simply associated with ancestry. And in order to do this, we actually need much more robust diverse data sets. Um, race and ethnicity, as we mentioned, are dynamic social factors. And though we might assume that it's uh, solely a social construct, it's actually much more reflective of ancestry than one might expect and also has the potential to provide relevant environmental information that can be a driver of risk and response um, and potentially measurable by epigenetics. Uh, this is also to mention that um, we are all admixed, so we all have different uh, mixtures of um, genetics. Um, and the relevance of that, again, is when we can actually understand uh, the variant of interest. Um, and with the appreciation that both race and ethnicity, as well as ancestry, are um, largely imperfect surrogates for what we'd like to better understand at the crux of biology and pathology. Uh, next slide, please. I think you might have to click again. Um, perfect, thank you. Um, this is just to level set on the, um, the current state of genomic information that's actually available. This is all available genome-wide um, association data. And you can see that 91% of this information is from a singular population, so from a European population. And that's actually 8% of the global population. So the vast majority of genome data that's available in the public arena is uh, comprised by the vast minority of humans on the planet. Um, so again, underscoring the need for more information on broader um, worldwide genotypic and phenotypic variation. Next slide. Unfortunately, diversity in clinical research and genomic research is not a new problem. Um, however, it is one that is critical to be addressed given the current moment that we're living in healthcare. So we have a significant increased understanding of disease biology. Um, we have more educated and empowered patients um, that are demanding um, and more aware of treatments that are available. We have new and novel technologies that can be deployed in research to better patient outcomes. Um, the regulatory environment is evolving and adjusting for these new approaches. And there's all uh, types of new partnerships that are being formed moving um, pharma, the pharma industry at large towards a more value-based and personalized focus. Um, with these rapid advancements in personalized healthcare and technology, the importance of representation and having more representative patient populations in our clinical and geno genomic research is certainly paramount. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So this is just a highlighting um, an additional example of that in the oncology space. So in oncology, genome-based healthcare is becoming the norm. In fact, molecular profiling is guideline recommended. Um, yet we know not all patients have access to these types of innovative diagnostics. Um, and we also know that guideline recommendations are based on genetic analyses derived from a singular European population. And given the appreciation that there are differences across ancestries that need to be appreciated, um, our uh, need for more diversity in genomic and clinical research is clearly uh, critical at this time. Um, and if you go to the next slide, thank you. Um, I believe this has been covered um, mostly around the appreciation that both disease pattern, uh, clinical presentation, and therapeutic response can vary dramatically by ancestral background and race and ethnicity. Um, I will also highlight that uh, biomarker prevalence, again, in the oncology setting can also vary based on ancestry. Um, we see this in lung cancer as a good example, where KRAS mutations are more common in European ancestry, um, whereas uh, EGFR mutations are more common in East Asian ancestral populations. Um, also to note that scientific discovery is enriched largely when we have greater populations included. And just one example of that is a breast cancer genomic study um, of Latino women, which 
led to this important discovery of a novel variant that has a protective effect. So I think um, Dr. Clark uh, categorized this as leaving, leaving science on the table. Um, we're leaving a lot of information undiscovered with the lack of appreciation for broader patient populations. If you go to the next slide, um, I won't get too much into the details here, but what I will say from the research standpoint, when we look at um, what genome-wide association studies can achieve, we have these great capabilities that are robust and powerful to understand genomics in a way that we've never been able to before. It helps us understand both biology, but also to identify new targets in the drug discovery process. What we have come to deeply appreciate is that single ancestry genome-wide association studies have very limited clinical utility. Moreover, inferences drawn from single ancestry uh, genome studies can be incomplete or inaccurate, and that's very dangerous. We've also seen that when you enrich for broader patient populations, variants that are otherwise undiscovered become clear. And this has been demonstrated in Alzheimer's disease, colorectal cancer, as well as rheumatoid arthritis. Go to the next slide, please. Um, this is just, again, to convey that uh, actionable targets can vary based on ancestry. This is, again, an oncology example. And with this appreciation, and the well-documented uh, racial disparities observed in cancer clinical outcomes. Um, this is just to underscore the importance of having more diverse data to inform both our understanding of genetic etiology, um, but also uh, position us better to begin to address disparities in outcome. Go to the next slide, please. Um, you might have to build this one. Yes, thank you. So. Um, I think all of us appreciate that the clinical development environment uh, includes a highly rigorous process that's truly fraught with failure. In fact, um, over 50% of clinical trials fail. We also know that uh, when targets have genetic uh, support and genetic data informing them, it increases our success rate in development. So genomic data increases clinical research success. Uh, recalling that the vast majority of our available genetic data is of a singular uh, ancestral population, um, you can see it's intuitive that more diversity in our genetic information will both better inform our research process, but quite frankly, further support our ability to have success in later stage development. Uh, the next slide, please. I think this is a build also. Perfect, thank you. Um, I want to orient us to the complexities of um, the determinants of health and outcomes. Certainly we've spent today talking a lot about genomics, um, but if you look at the determinants of health, genetics and biology is actually the minority um, of the factors that influence one's health and outcomes. So it's with a deep appreciation that we have to couple our understanding of biology and genetic information with a deep understanding of the social determinants and factors that contribute largely um, and holistically to a patient's health. Um, next slide, please. So I, I want to just re-articulate that we have this amazing opportunity at this influx of science and technology where we can appreciate differences across individuals in a way we could never do before. Um, we can understand proteomic, microbiome, we can understand epigenetic differences. Um, so it's, it's both a critical time for science and medicine to leverage this unprecedented opportunity, um, but it's also an obligation for the clinical and medical communities to have more diversity in our research and genomic data sets. This will really position us to address disparities and improve medical treatments for all patients, um, unlike uh, no opportunity we've ever had before. And I'll leave you with that as we head into our discussion. And I believe I'll pass it back to Dr. Beer. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful, wonderful presentation or set of presentations and discussion. I can't wait to get into the discussion. Um, let me start with saying um, 
to to Dr. Ritchie. Uh, in my the way I think about things, the only clinical trials that fail are those trials that fail to complete. So when you say that they failed, did they fail to differentiate, you know, a um, or to to reject the null hypothesis, or did they fail to complete? Number one, and number two, on the same slide. You, you suggest or in one could infer that by coupling uh, genetic information or ancestry information, one might see greater success rates. Um, but one might also posit then that if one includes a greater diversity of genetic information or ancestry in information, that success rate might decrease. So let me ask those two first. So uh, the first question in regard to the trial failure is actually specifically to um, the null failure to inform the null hypothesis, so not completion of trials. That number would probably be much larger, um, and it's strikingly so um, if you included the failure rate of non-completion, because you're right, that's, that's quite a challenge. Arguably, having more inclusive research could support the latter, so completion of trials and having patients that have more access to research opportunities. Um, your second point, um, so yes, to clarify, it's, it's been established that, um, that molecules with genomic uh, informa information coupled with genomic information actually do have an increased success rate. Um, I would I would pose the question, I guess, a couple of different ways. When you're talking about success, it means having more information available. And so one could conclude that having more information and understanding would actually be a de-risking element um, to appreciate um, even safety uh, uh, components of uh, having differences across populations. So you're right, I think it's, um, it's an intuition that having more diversity would be more informative. I think that's not just from a success factor of efficacy, but also understanding potential risk elements, um, particularly as we've discussed today, as they're related to HLA variants or cytochrome um, um, single nu nucleotide polymorphisms that are really relevant, right, to the safety um, and um, elements of um, of a, a benefit risk profile for a given molecule. So I think it's probably um, success defined by not just efficacy measures, but safety as well. Thank you. And let me, let me follow on with a question for all of you, which is that it seems to me that, you know, we do a disservice by asking, um, you know, self-defined race and ethnicity in such large buckets that we um, lose the, the important discriminations that you know, um, you Latha have spoken about for just the Asian population. That's true of every, true of Black and African American populations, and true of every other. You know, as you showed the the Mexican um, Puerto Rican differences, Luther. So, how it, as we think about going forward. How do you suggest that we um, ask these questions in a way that are informative, but then don't sort of um, create so many small subgroups that nothing's analyzable at all without huge data and huge clinical trials. And that particularly when coupled with social determinants of health is gonna become incredibly complex. Maybe that's the challenge that we need to take on but how do you approach, how, how should we approach that challenge? So I'll start, uh, Dr. Beer, and, and say that our understanding of how to do science is evolving in terms of diverse populations. And I'll remind us that not too long ago, a generation ago, we didn't even study women. Whenever we did animal studies, it was only male animals. And we realized that that was an error, right? In, in the document that we wrote, we showed that half of the drugs that have been taken off the market or been amended in, in the uh, last years have been because of differences in women, 
that we didn't realize in the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So, so, and, and I will admit that, you know, I've spent 20 years of my life studying a specific race ethnicity, but whenever I give a talk to students and I gave a lecture yesterday, you know, the next question they ask is what about mixed race, right? What about social determinants of health? And I want us to understand the limitations of um, the data that we had previously in terms of these are the categories that are available in the census and mortality data and the National Health Information Survey. That does not mean by any means that we should be limited by that going forward. I absolutely think that we should um, unpack, you know, the socio-political construct of, of race ethnicity in this country. You know, there's a lot packed into there. And for a long time in this country, when we were, were studying things and said that there were black white differences buried in there were socioeconomic differences, were bias differences, were discrimination differences. And I think that we have the opportunity going forward and the mandate in fact, to unpack that and to study mixed race populations and to study ancestry versus um, race, ethnicity, and, um, and so much more, which is, is daunting, but also very exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and, yeah, and, and I, would, yeah, I would just add to that, uh, there, there, there are uh, significant difficulties and limitations, but I, I think we may be at a point now where there is a tremendous uh, opportunity. And if we think about, you know, what are some of the lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic, you could put both of these in that category with the different uh, variants of the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus that are appearing in different uh, regions and then uh, traveling to others. So I think it's increasing awareness and interest of the importance and value of genetics. In that case, it's the uh, virus. But as I showed in one of the examples, the one uh, uh, looking at hepatitis C virus, uh, sometimes there are interactions between you know, the virus a genome and the uh, human genome. The, the same thing I would say uh, for social determinants. Uh, there's tr a tremendous amount of interest now in social determinants, uh, but how do you collect them? Which do you collect? And how do you use that uh, in your uh, decision-making? And again, if we think about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and those groups that are disproportionately and negatively impacted, there are clearly some social determinants that uh, contribute to that. When you, you look at uh, you know, the black community for uh, example, the, uh, you know, the, the neighborhood, the home environment, the multi-generational large families, uh, dense population is a risk. The presence of uh, comorbidities, uh, which are increased uh, is a risk. The, uh, the high uh, frequency of, of uh, essential work that exposes individuals are at risk. So th those are all uh, social determinants and are in that category that some are referred to as your zip code versus your genetic code, but clearly both are important. And I think one of the real opportunities uh, here now too, as you heard from both Dr. Zarichi and Dr. Uh, Palaniapan, um, is to uh, really uh, think about you know, how do you uh, bring those two together? And specifically, you know, what might be the biological implications or determinants of what we see on the surface as, uh, as social determinants? So, so there is some opportunity here now. It's, it's just a question of how do we proceed and which problem uh, can we, we solve? But this, this may be one of the best times ever to uh, take this on. So I think everyone here would agree completely with what you just said. So let me ask the final question. How should we proceed? What data should we be collecting? Um, how can we do that nationally and internationally in a way that doesn't burden the system in a way that we cannot um, succeed? What are your thoughts on that? I think um, a great opportunity is looking to um, our large uh, um, health plans are really looking to understand social determinants and community matching for needs and populations. And they're thinking about it from a different perspective than we are around 
what drives cost of care. And there's been a great amount of work done to appreciate that the three biggest social determinants for cost to healthcare systems are social isolation, financial instability, and low medical literacy. Um, I'm sure they vary across populations and communities, but the data is available um, if we think about leveraging um, large organizations and non-traditional partnerships um, and understanding what they think about, again, is driving cost of care. Well, how do you mitigate that? And I know there is a good amount of work happening um, to start community outreach programs that are matching um, the needs that are identified by the social determinants to actual outreach. So I think that's probably a great place to start. Go to um, a non-traditional partner to learn about what are those factors that we need to be thinking about. And I envision a world where precision medicine is not just a medicine, it's a social signature um, where you actually have a, a holistic picture of what a patient needs and you can provide them an outcome, not just a delivery of a drug. Thank you. Dr. Polonia Penn? Well, I think, you know, and again, I'm, I'm a scientist, I would say, you know, collect as much information as you can, um, you know, ag aggregate it in the ways that you can and, and acknowledge the limitations of, of what we're doing now in terms of, here's all the things that, you know, we wanted to study that we weren't able to study that, you know, uh, we hope to be able to study in the future. And I think social determinants of health even in, in the US are, is not as easy as just asking your income or your education, right? So we have to go beyond those, mm -hmm. those measures um, also, but uh, you know, kind of understanding where we are and, and, and where we need to go and understanding there's a gap and understanding that there, we can only take little steps. Thank you. And Dr. Clark. Yeah, sure. And, and, I, and I would say a couple of things. Uh, one, I, I certainly second all the comments that have just been made but I would say that social determinants are not on the table. You know, that is something that we're all focused on, we're thinking about. And your question is a much more difficult one uh, in terms of how do we uh, proceed. And, and I would suggest that there are probably several things to think about. One is uh, in organizations like ours where there's, uh, you know, uh, medicines discovery and development. I mean, what information do we already collect and how might that be used uh, to inform decisions that might increase diversity, uh, such as the attributes of uh, potential participants and also the selection of uh, sites. And in the context of another uh, popular area where we think about making our clinical trials more patient-centered, more patient-centric, more patient-friendly, uh, and in this uh, era of digital, virtual, and remote, where we'd like to move our studies into the communities where the patients are. You know, what are those social determinants that impact our ability to do that and the ability, ability and willingness of participants to really be a part of our, our clinical trials? So it, it does sound like we're, we're early uh, in the uh, progress to be made here, but we're at the point where I would say it's now a priority and that there's interest and we will need guidance uh, from different sectors uh, uh, such as uh, three of you and others as to you know, what do we collect and uh, how do we do that uh, across the board rather than you know, every sponsor making decisions about what they think may be key. So, so, some, so some type of uniformity and decision of what we will collect but also what might already be collected I think uh, would be a key place to uh, invest some effort now. So I realize we're over time and I want to thank everyone for their participation, both the participants, I'm sorry we didn't get to some of your questions, um, and uh, to the panelists for whom we are incredibly indebted for the rich conversation. I do think that thinking together about how to make this a national priority so that we're collecting data in a way that we can then use together and aggregate and uh, disaggregate um, and reanalyze uh, is going to be essential. And I look forward to working with everyone on this and, and please feel free to email uh, us if uh, you're interested in pursuing this further together. We look forward to a different future.
Thank you very much and um, good night and good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And thank you.